Good evening. My name is Cynthia Peabody. I'm the um, Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Science and Religion. Uh, Bob Pollack is sitting here. He is our director. Annie Tickell is here, and she is our events person. Can you hear? No? no. Is this, do you think this is on, Annie? I can scream. How, how about this? Can anybody? Good evening? Yes. <laughs> I'll start all over again. Good evening. My name is Cynthia Peabody, and I'm the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Science and Religion. Bob Pollack, sitting right there, who will be doing the Q&A session this evening, is the director. And Annie Tickell is right here, and she is our events person. I want to welcome you all. And um, I am very honored and excited to introduce my, uh, my colleague and friend, Pilar Jennings. Pilar is a psychoanalyst practicing in New York City who is focused on the clinical applications of Buddhist meditation practice. She received her PhD in psychiatry and religion from Union Theological Seminary and has been working with patients and their families through the Harlem Family Institute since 2004. Prior to this training, she earned a master's in medical anthropology from Columbia University and a bachelor's in interdisciplinary writing from Barnard. Dr. Jennings is a long-term pr practitioner of Tibetan and Vipassana Buddhism and has studied with senior teachers in both traditions. Her publications have included East of Ego, the Intersection of Narcissism and Buddhist Meditation Practice, and I've Been Waiting for You, Reflections on Analytic Pain. Her most recent work, Mixing Minds, was released in December 2010 through Wisdom Publications, in which she explores the interpersonal dynamics between Buddhist teachers and their Western students in comparison to the relationship between psychoanalysts and their patients. Dr. Jennings has also trained as a Buddhist chaplain through the Zen Center for Contemplative Care. Through this training in contemplative care at Beth Israel Hospital in New York City, she's brought the combination of her divergent intersex and background to another population in need of sensitive psychological and spiritual care. As a psychoanalyst, researcher, and contemplative care provider, she's made efforts to explore the psychological and spiritual needs of disenfranchised populations. So I read that because it was handed to me. What I would like to say is Pilar is very, very gifted in taking some very raw and tangled issues and helping us very gently and very elegantly to understand them and still come out feeling like we're going to be OK. And for that, I thank her and really appreciate her work. So here's Dr. Pilar Jennings. Thank you so much, Cynthia. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been affiliated with the CSSR now for a number of years, so I am uh, very delighted to have this opportunity to talk with you about a topic that is of interest to me. Uh, it is really the heart of what I do and, and study and practice. And what I'm going to do tonight is talk to you a little bit about how psychoanalysis, and in particular the intersubjective school of psychoanalysis, understands our capacity to be relational with ourselves and with others in contrast to how Buddhism, and I'll, I'll focus my comments on Tibetan Buddhist teachings, understand that very same capacity. I'm just going to adjust the equipment here. And what I'll do at 
at the end of my talk is share some images with you that, for me, evoke some of what it is I'm going to be talking about with you tonight. Um, for many years, I've been a big fan of, of Amy Pollock and her artwork. Um, and she has, for quite some time, been illustrating Bob Pollock's scientific work. And for us visual learners, it's an extraordinary gift. And so inspired by what she does, I'm going to show you some, some photographs and some paintings and some sculptures that I think might help us enter into this material. So as a starting point, I'd like to just introduce to you, particularly for those of you who are entirely new to intersubjectivity as a school of thought, how that came about, how it understands our, our relational tendencies. And generally speaking, intersubjectivity uh, grew out of the tradition of psychoanalysis, which, as many of you know, was originally considered to be a one-person psychology, insofar as the focus was really on the discrete mind and the instincts housed in that mind, right? Regardless of the parenting a particular child received, regardless of the family system that child was in, Freud, who was the founder of psychoanalysis as we know it, um, really had it as his mission to try and understand the science of the mind, and in this way was quantifying the mind as a discrete entity. Now, Freud has um, left us an extraordinary legacy of riches and insights, which I value hugely, although I think that his, his approach to the human condition has been modified in very important ways. And basically, over the course of the last 50 or 60 years, psychoanalysts have become increasingly curious about how a child develops, how the mind develops independence upon their earliest relational experience. And so they, the object relations came into being. Uh, and it, indeed, they were also very respectful of a Freudian approach to psychoanalysis. But they wanted to shift the focus right, from the discrete child to how the child is, is experiencing their own selfhood and other through the context of relationship. And then, approximately 40 years ago or so, the intersubjective school began. And this school was ushered in by theorists such as George Atwood and Bob Stollero, Donna Orange, Jessica Benjamin, uh, Bernard Branshaft, and others. And what they, they began to do is to look very carefully at the, the parent-child dyad. And I, I wish to say, as someone who is steeped in a faith tradition, who's also very interested in culture, that I don't believe the whole of the human experience can be reduced to what happens within the parent-child dyad. Certainly, that isn't the case, and yet, what happens is extremely influential. And so these theorists started to pay close attention to some of the patterns between a baby and his or her care provider. And in particular, they were looking at recurring patterns and what became known as organizing principles. So these principles through which the child would experience the adult and all subsequent relationship. And I'll break that, that down a little bit as we continue tonight. So if I, if I were someone who used PowerPoint, I would have a slide at this point. <laughs> I'm a hopeless Luddite, so I'm, I'm not going to use PowerPoint. I'm just going to do this old school and talk to you until I show you these images. But if I did use PowerPoint, I would have a slide that says, what is intersubjectivity? And the response would be patterns of mutual engagement. So that's, that's the key phrase. That's the mantra here, right? So it's, it's not a one-time event. It's not any, anything monolithic in that early relationship. 
but it's about these recurring patterns between the parent and the child or the care provider and the child. And what the intersubjective theorists are looking at are the ways in which these very particular patterns shape the child's sense of who they are and who the other is, and their ex the extent to which they can see the other as real. And the finding, not surprisingly, is that we need an attuned other. We need a person who is deeply interested, deeply invested in our experience from the very beginning, right? Not just so that we can have a good and relaxed feeling. This is an important point. But most importantly, so that we begin to have the felt sense that our fundamental needs, our desires, our preferences can be known by another. So this sense of attunement begins to weave into our, our sense of self as a, a self that is highly visible and understandable to another, right? There's, there's nothing that is severing the connection. Now, another way of describing this is it's the experience of feeling known in the other's view of us. And this is something that Jessica Benjamin writes about, and I think it's, it's quite compelling. And I'll say it again, because I think it's, it's something that people can relate to. It's the feeling of being known in the other's view of us. So sometimes we have the sense of, of being in a relationship where our reality doesn't seem to get through, right? We are receiving other people's projections we're receiving other people's reactivity, and whatever it is we might be going through, or whoever it is we experience ourselves to be, remains hidden and unknown. But in a truly intersubjective field, right, and by field I mean the space, the mental space between two people, there's this sense that the way the person is seeing me, and in this instance the way the care provider is seeing the child, is resonant with how the child experiences him or herself. Okay. Another important point is that this is not just about influence, right? And sometimes when I teach this material, it's easy to imagine that that's what I'm talking about, is having a positive or a negative influence on a child. But really, it's about the developmental capacity to step in the shoes of another, right? So if the child is on the receiving end of someone who is really quite skillfully attuned to who they are, the child begins to develop that same capacity to be curious about who the care provider is. So it's getting and it's giving. It's getting and giving in this mutual pattern over and over again from the very beginning. Another way of thinking about this, and this was something that Jessica Benjamin really ushered into the analytic conversation, is that a third space develops, both between the parent and the child, but also internally in, in the child's mind. And in that space, the other can be held. So as that third space is developing, what's happening between parent and child is a sense of both mutual accommodation, right, where they're working together, they're teaching each other how to relate, right, but there's also what's called affective resonance. Basically means that the care provider is, is very attuned to what the baby is feeling, right, and, and an important point is that for babies and for young children, Feelings are very, very much conflated with selfhood. So we experience what we're feeling as who we are. And so if our care provider is really attuned to the, the broad spectrum of our feeling states, we get the sense that who we are can be known. It's not just that they understand what we're going through. It's that they get who we are. But another important point is that there is a teaching process going on. And I think maybe, Annie, did you ask yesterday if, or someone else in the class asked if this is, 
this effort to be attuned to a baby is something that uh, needs to be learned, right? Or is it intuitive? And what the intersubjective folks would say is that there is a learning process in every relationship, including the parent-child relationship. So they are, they are teaching each other how to, how to be in intimate relationship, how to know each other imperfectly, right? But with a basic sense of attunement. And Michael Eigen, who is a, a wonderful analyst who practices here in the city, also writes about how, as an analyst, he needs his patients to teach him how to be their analyst, right? It's, it's not a magical process. It's a learning process that happens within each dyad. So this thirdness, this third space, has as its correlate Winnicott's notion, for those of you who are familiar with D.W. Winnicott. Uh, he was a British psychoanalyst and psychiatrist who worked beautifully with parents and children and had a real capacity to step into the shoes of a child and, and just be in their reality. And he talked about transitional spaces. Right, so that space within the child's mind and outside of the child's mind so that they begin to get a sense that it's possible to stay connected to themselves, right, but also start to venture forth into a field outside of themselves, right, so both and, and in that transitional space a great deal of discovery happens where the child begins to get a sense that there's a world beyond themselves that they are creating, but it doesn't come exclusively from them. They are co-creating this reality. Okay, so what happens if this thirdness, right, this third space never develops, or it develops and then it collapses? Many of us may have not had the experience of in early life, having that attunement where that third space was naturally cultivated. So there are a couple of things that will tend to happen, right, if, if we don't have that, that inner space for other in mind. And the first one is that it can feel like one person is acting and the other person is reacting. So there's no mutual reciprocal effect right? Each person loses the other. So if I'm on the receiving end, right, of someone who, who lacks that third space in mind, I feel done to, right? I feel that they are reacting to me and not knowing me. And as a result, there's a great deal of helplessness that can ensue, right? I can't, I can't get through to this person. <laughs> no matter what it is I do, no matter what it is I try, right? They are in their own discrete reality, and I am not a part of that. Now, I see a lot of nodding heads, and when I teach this material, I think it's, it's not difficult to reference the experience of helplessness being on the receiving end of someone who can't keep you in mind, right? What's a little bit harder to see in ourselves and easier to see in others is the other byproduct of a collapsed third space, which is feelings of omnipotence and omnipresence, right? So rather than being done to, I'm going to do to you reactively. I'm going to dominate the space so that you can't tune me out. I'm going to tune you out before you tune me out, right? And I think this can take many, many forms. And many forms that seem innocuous because of the content, but are nevertheless manifestations of this reactive effort at protection. So for instance, religious musing, right? Or musing on any belief system that a person experiences as salvific or highly healing, really to enter deeply into discussion about that without any indication that it's relevant or meaningful to the listener. A way of, of protecting oneself, 
you know, from feeling dropped by the other. So an important point is this doesn't mean that we need perfect relational experiences, right? In order, in order to have a third space internally and in order to share an intersubjective field that's lively with another. We don't. And psychoanalysts from the very beginning have been very careful to point out that one of the ways in which we discover the other and we discover the external world is through being frustrated, right? Being frustrated by the person who has been attuned to us. So Kohut referred to this as optimal frustrations, right? Which I like very much. <laughs> so it has a very benign sound to it. Um, and the intersubjective folks say something similar, that intimacy is not about perfect connection. It's about a connection that's disrupted and then repaired over and over again. And I think of it as a little bit like a crochet stitch. Connection, disruption, repair, connection, disruption, repair, over and over and over. And in that process, there's a working through with someone, right? Or between an individual and a group, where again, there's a learning process, right? This is, this is how I need to stay in connection with you. Okay, we've lost the connection, can we work it out? That's actually what constitutes true intimacy from an intersubjective point of view. So clinically, this is extremely relevant. And in my own clinical experience, I have found this to be very helpful, in part because most patients who venture into therapy do so because they've experienced some kind of a fractured relationship, some kind of an interpersonal connection that may never have been repaired. And so it's not even that they suffered the disconnection, it's that there was never any real effort or opportunity to do the healing, right? That, that might have been possible. And that's actually what can constitute you know, the residual traumatic feeling. So in the clinical space, you know, between a therapist and a patient, one of the things that I have certainly learned and, and was trained to be aware of is that an impasse is inevitable. You know, a feeling of disconnection with the patient is inevitable, and that's actually just part of the relational experience. The question is, you know, can you create the condition so that the repair is possible. And Jessica Benjamin again and Bernie Brenshaft and others have had some really meaningful insights into how that healing process might happen. And the first thing they suggest, and I've, I've found this to be quite useful, is for the therapist just to stay focused on their own participation and the rupture. And that can be hard to do, you know, as the therapist, if you feel like you know you're dealing with a very complicated, uncomplex source of suffering that your patient is bringing to the relationship, right? Nevertheless, every projection has a hook to be hung on. So to really own the hook in the therapist can be a way of communicating to the patient that the buck stops here, right? And many times patients have had the experience repeatedly of never having someone, particularly the people whom they have felt harmed by, simply take responsibility for the way the person is feeling harmed, right? It doesn't mean that it isn't a complicated situation, but simply to take responsibility and say, I am sorry. I am sorry. Before there's, now I'm talking about the dyadic relationship, before there's any exploration of transference and countertransference, simply to say, I am sorry, right? And in that way to model for the patient that it's okay, it, it doesn't harm me to take responsibility here, 
In fact, it gives me a sense of agency. Not an easy thing to do, by the way. <laughs> Not an easy thing at all, and yet it can generate a tremendous feeling both of integrity, but also real hope for repair. And so finally, before I shift to what the Buddha, the Buddha has to say about our relational capacity, from an analytic point of view, collaboration is key, right? Working together, teaching each other how to work through an impasse. And in that way, both people learn that no one player is all powerful. Both people have agency. Both people have a capacity to heal. OK. Now, what does Buddhism have to say about intimacy? And just so I, I know who I'm talking to, how many of you practice Buddhism of some kind? OK, a fair number of you. So if you study the, the sutras and the tantras, you notice a radically different language right, from analytic language. Um, it is focused on universal experience and truths rather than dyadic and individual experiences. So it really zooms out, and it has a look at the human condition, um, not irregardless of culture, but it wants to posit that there are universal elements to the lived experience. It also has a tendency to look at what I would call our capacities that develop in the second stage of life. Right? So it's really interested in our ability to transcend our suffering, to transform, right? to awaken, whereas psychoanalysis has typically been focused on early childhood. So they're really looking at, at different ends of the spectrum. And if I had to synthesize the Dharma, and by Dharma I mean Buddha te Buddhist teachings, in terms of uh, this theme of being relational, I would say that the, the Dharma proposes that when we feel we are fundamentally separate from others, when we experience them as being discrete and separate from whom we are, then we have misperceived reality, right? And so that would be the breakdown, the collapse of the third space. But already you can see that you have to have certain cognitive capacities to think through what the Dharma is suggesting. And that could get transmitted from parent to child, but some adult right, has to have this ability to really enter into these, these teachings. And this, this suggests that we suffer when we misperceive reality. Right? And so the Dharma suggests that there are three, three poisons or three sources of major struggle, attachment, aversion, and ignorance. And ignorance is not lack of information, but this fundamental misperceiving of, of what's real, of what's true. And by truth, the Dharma suggests that we are fundamentally connected to each other. We, we inter are. We have something to do with each other that we tend not to understand, and we behave as if it's not real. And this is built upon the notion that all phenomena is dynamic, changing, fluid, right? So we are by our very nature impermanent. Everything about us, our bodies, our minds, our circumstances, our relationships, nothing is fixed. Nothing can be clung to. And yet we wish that that were so. <laughs> Right? Because if we really grapple with the truth of our impermanence, then we realize that we're, we are in a state of flux all the time. And the things that seem to give comfort are actually more tenuous than we imagine. Doesn't mean that we can't appreciate deeply right, the people that we value, the things that we do in our lives that we value. But the Dharma wants to suggest that 
ultimately nothing can be clung to, right? And as a result, because of this impermanence, we have something to do with each other. We are co-creating each other. And it's through this insight that we have this capacity to care deeply about another and to imagine that your problems are as real as my own. You know, your struggles with suffering matter as much as my struggles. And it's a way to, to soften a clinging of the discrete self and clinging to, to myself as more important or more meaningful than anyone else. But the problem is, says the Dharma, that we very, very easily lapse into a feeling of disconnection, right? It's, it's, not, it's not easy to sustain a felt sense of belonging to each other, right, of co-creating each other, especially if we're in a highly individualistic culture where it seems as though we need to go for a limited amount of goodies and get the goodies before somebody else does. Right? So there's nothing collaborative about that. I want to get rid of my competitors and get this, this stuff for myself. Right? That comes out of a, a feeling of being fundamentally disconnected. If I really felt that we were connected, then I would rejoice in other people's achievements rather than suffer horrendous envy. So there's something very psychologically healing about this notion of, of co-creation and interbeing. So you might be wondering, well, OK, this all sounds very good, but how do you come to experience interbeing? Right? How do you, through the Dharma, find yourself feeling genuinely connected to others and not in constant battle or competition with others? And the Buddha gave 84,000 teachings, so there are quite a few methods. But one primary method that informs all of the Buddhist traditions, and, and they're quite divergent, is meditation. And meditation serves many purposes, but if I had to reduce its function, the idea is to find a way to settle, right? Settle the, the human experience, settle our mind, so we can get to know the nature of mind. So often, particularly for those of us who live in urban settings and we're professional and we have families, it can be very hard to know what's happening in our minds and how we typically relate to our minds which is why if you happen to experience a silent retreat, it can be quite shocking <laughs> to recognize that you have been carrying rage, grief, uh, deep frustration, right, longings, a lot of very, very strong affect that is totally unconscious. So meditation is a method to, to try and take time to simply note what is in the mind and how do we work with the mind. Now, the historical Buddha Shakyamuni wanted to suggest that if we stick with that method, and, and the method has very particular teachings, but if we stick with it, what we'll find is this lovely space. So it's interesting that we've got the transitional space, we've got the third space, and the Buddha Dharma wants to suggest that there is this space between our many thoughts and our feelings, right, and our longings. And it's a space of peacefulness, placid being, right, unhurried, unconcerned, goodness, interestingly. So if you drill down into our most fundamental being, said the historical Buddha Shakyamuni, you find this, this inner goodness, right? Very peaceful, very content, not, not ensnared in any sense of identity or thought process. Some of you are nodding, <laughs> and some of you, uh, you may not buy it, 
because it's hard to imagine if we begin to cultivate what feels like a reified identity based on chronic thought processes, right, and very strong emotionality. But in my experience, it is true that through meditation, it's possible to have these moments of rest in between you know, an active, an otherwise active mind. And in that state of rest, what can happen is we no longer feel so tethered to our primary identities. It's just, a, it's just an experience. It's just a sense of being. And interestingly, it feels very spacious, as if others might have something to do with that state as well, and that it's a state that we could all enter into together. There's no sense of that, that membrane that Winnicott talks about that demarcates self from other. So in this way, the idea is that if the practitioner stays with the, the method of meditation, a spontaneous experience of compassion will arise. Right? So compassion is not a moral achievement from a Buddhist perspective. It really grows out of this deeply experiential sense that we are all, we are all a part of this beingness. Right? And that these identity markers have an illusory nature. And there are many interesting stories in, in the sutras that exemplify this, and, and one that I'll share with you briefly um, is about the, the great Indian uh, teacher and sage, Naropa. And during his, his studies at Alanda, he, legend has it, had this vision of an elderly woman disfigured in 37 horrifying ways. And they had this moment of interaction where she looked at him and she asked him if he understood the Dharma. And feeling quite confident he was renowned for his intellect, very brilliant student, he said, yeah, I do. To which she cackled madly and she said, um, you sure? And he said, yeah. If you're not sure, do you think there's someone who knows the Dharma better than I do? And she took him on this journey in which Tilopa, who was this woman's brother, managed to manifest in a variety of forms. He manifested as a leper. He manifested as a sick dog. He manifested uh, as a beggar, as a woman, uh, as a child, in a variety of forms that Naropa had no interest in relating to. And so Naropa would walk around these forms, walk over them, uh, feel disgust and aversion toward them, trying to meet this person that this woman had suggested authentically understood the Dharma. Eventually, Tilopa resumed human form and continued to, to vex Naropa by uh, insisting that he do all sorts of difficult things. He, he asked him to assault royalty, um, to, to engage in all sorts of painful exercises until eventually, legend has it, he hit him with his shoe, which facilitated his enlightenment. I like the end of that story. But the idea being that once we work through the illusory nature of identity, right, and discrete identity, we begin to, to recognize the Buddha nature in all beings, and that all beings have a source of wisdom. One last story that I'll, I'll tell before I show you some images is the story of Kisa Gotami. Uh, and this is a story that Buddhists love to tell, and I've heard it many times and, and many variations, but the basic idea was that there was a woman during the time of the historical Buddha. And because this was a time of great, great turbulence and scarcity and great deal of illness, she had lost several children. And she had an infant who died. And she was so grief-stricken that she could not tolerate 
acceptance of this loss. And so she frantically began looking for anyone who could do something to revive the child. And she was uh, approaching all sorts of people, asking them to please help her in some way. And, and everybody looked at her with sorrow, saying that there was nothing they could do until she found someone who said that there was this sage who was the historical Buddha who happened to be teaching not far from where they were, and maybe she could ask him. So she did. She found him, and she waited until he finished his teaching and then approached him, and he could see the frantic grief in her eyes, and he was renowned for being a great clinician, so he didn't try to, to bypass that grief. Um, he really wanted to hold it lovingly and honor it, and so he said, well, maybe there is something that I can do. And she was desperate to find out, so he said, if you can get a mustard seed from a household where there has been no death, right, I will make you a special medicine, so please go and find it. And so she set out desperately to find this mustard seed and knocked on door after door, and of course, as you can imagine, every household had experienced loss. Every household had had a loved one who had died, and so nobody could offer her this needed mustard seed. And the story goes that she made her way back to the Buddha, and during this journey back to him, she told him that she had had an awakening that she realized what she had suffered uh, was part of the human condition, was a suffering that everyone had known, and that she felt joined with them as a result of this experience. And she became known as the great compassionate one and was taken into the order. Um, so I think that story is, is an important one, in part because it lifts up this Buddhist notion that it's not enough just to, to feel compassion right, for others. We also need insight. We need both. So compassion without the insight can just end up lapsing into sentimentality. And insight without the compassion can be a bit cold and disconnected. And so she, she experienced the marriage of insight and compassion that allowed her to, to generate a well of compassion and feelings of connection to others. So before I take some questions, what I'm going to do now is, if I can turn this on, let's see. Um, you can even, I'm tapping it and it doesn't seem to want to Whoop, I don't want to do that. How do I go back? Let's see. Um, I might need you, Annie. This, this piece, uh, which is in the Met, because for me it, ev it evokes the Sangha. And so there are three jewels in Buddhism, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And the idea being that we really cannot awaken without community, right? We cannot contact our own Buddha nature alone. Now this one, this is a Cartier-Bresson photograph, and this is taken in India in 1950. Uh, very powerful photo for me, because I was just recently in, in Bodh Gaya, where I experienced very similar scenes all day, every day. And part of what was so harrowing is you can feel the desperation here of 
can you see me as human? Right? Can you respond to me as a human being? Is there a space in your mind for me or not? This is another Cartier-Bresson taken in Pakistan. Um, and again, for me, this evokes a feeling of a profound interbeing, right? That there is very much a, a third space in which they're holding a, you know, a collective emotional experience. This, this photo I like very much. It's called Women of Allah. And what it touches on for me is the way she is experiencing feeling met, right? There's someone there. There's something that she's being greeted by and who's receiving her. So it's an intensely relational experience. And I, I chose this photo in part because in one of the classes that I'm teaching now, we've talked about how our early childhood experience and our attachment history can be worked through, it can be healed in our religious lives if we have uh, a healthy enough teacher and a healthy enough community. And it can get reinforced through the experience of communing with some other, whatever that other is, that we experience as receiving us and receiving us unconditionally. This is a, a piece that depicts uh, the Buddha Shakyamuni's first teaching with his original Sangha. And I like this too because the story goes that the Buddha Shakyamuni had no original interest in talking about his experience of awakening. He thought it was pretty much a, a hopeless endeavor. It was too complicated, right? Too multifaceted to try and articulate. And after 49 days, uh, his cousin and servant Ananda asked him repeatedly, can you please try? <laughs> so he gave it a whirl and he found his, his original Hindu cohorts uh, and began the first wheel of the teachings, the first wheel of the Dharma. This is another Cartier-Bresson and I find this, this photo to be a little bit painful. Um, in part because there's clearly a collective experience going on. So I imagine that these children, I, I don't know what the circumstances were, but I imagine that you know, these children have all been through something together, right? So there's a, an entering in, and yet they all have their own you know, sort of disconnected reality. And also this space here, these burnt out spaces, to me just symbolize the sense of a space that you need that isn't there. This is one of my all-time favorite Cartier-Bresson photographs. Um, in part, for me, I experience pure interbeing right? Pure interdependence. They're all leaning on each other. Again, I don't know what the circumstances are. <laughs> I've had this photo actually on my uh, office wall for many, many years, and I, I look into it every day wondering what it is that's going on. But what I'm struck by is the sense of safety that, that they have each other, right? That they somehow made their way into the other person's mind, and thus there's a feeling of safety and security. This is an interesting photograph. It's, it's called Afternoon Constitutional. And to me, it, it evokes a feeling of longing, right? Longing for this man to be having this dyadic experience. Of course, he could be having a perfectly rich experience of his own, holding other people in mind. I don't know. Um, but that's, that's what it evokes for me. Now, I don't think that I can make this one any larger. Oh, I can, okay. Um, I find this to be a, a, oh, let's see what just happened. Okay, I think I need you again. 
So I'll just try and make that a little bit bigger. Um, this is a photograph of a, a woman alone on a Central Park bench. Um, and again, I can feel, feel the longing for a space in which to be held. And this one many of you may be familiar with, uh, Eve Klein's Leap Into the Void. And, and part of what I like about it, I mean, there are many ways to interpret this photo, and sorry, I'll try and make it a little bit larger. That when we try to go it alone, <laughs> it's a little bit like leaping onto pavement, right? And so he is going with, with total grandiosity, but it's probably not going to turn out well. And this, many of you um, may be fans of Mary Cassette, and she's an American painter, and she typically will, will paint mother-child scenes, and I think she captures so beautifully the way in which the child can just surrender to the mother, right? There's really that, again, that felt sense that there's this someone who can hold not only my body, but my feelings. And here's another one where you really experience the child leaning into her. And also, it's interesting to see the way in which their expressions are, are very much uh, attuned to each other, which is usually indicative of a securely attached mother and child. This is a photo that I, I love very much. So this is my teacher, His Holiness Saki Trizen, with His Holiness the, the Dalai Lama. And to me, this photo symbolizes so beautifully the intersubjective third, right? That they are very much holding each other, right? Literally here, but very much in mind. So it's a mind to mind transition. But the other thing that I find to be quite beautiful about this is there's no submission going on here. Right? So no coercion, no submission. There is just the, the wish to enter into something very intimate together. And this is a Walker Evans uh, photo, which I think is, is quite provocative. And he's taken a series of photographs of mothers and children on, on the subway in the 1930s and 40s. And this is one, one photo that for me, really captures the profoundly sad disconnection, right, of, of two people clearly joined um, biologically, but not in mind. And the despair, the despair that they both feel as a result, it's not just the child's despair. Here's another Walker Evans. And similar to the Mary Cassatt, you can, you can feel the way in which the child can surrender to, to the mother and trust that the mother can understand a little bit about what the child is feeling, right? The need, the need to be held, the need to be cared for. Another image. And this is a photograph that my teacher took of the Sakya monks working on a San Mandala. And I love this, this photo for its symbolism because the, the mandala in Tibetan Buddhism represents many things, but one of the things it symbolizes is the Buddha's mind, right? So here, they're all surrendering, right, to the mind of the awakened one in the hope that their minds will be known and awakened as well. And then we're back to the beginning. So at that point, I would love to, to take some questions. Maybe I will, I'll just leave that up. Well, let's see. 
Annie will come around with the microphone. I think it's not working, so just speak. Annie won't come around with the microphone. Ask a question, and if uh, I, I think you'll decide whether to repeat it. Sure. Okay? And uh, let's go. Somebody. Anybody? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the question for those of you in the back is, how do I integrate my Buddhist practice within the clinical setting? Um, is there an explicit reference to Buddhism? Do I use Buddhist language, etc.? And my Buddhist practice influences the way I practice clinically. Um, in both subtle and overt ways. And I'm certainly not tethered to my patients developing an interest in Buddhism at all. Although, the more I practice, the less shy I am about asking patients if they have some kind of spiritual practice and community. Because in my experience, it, it tends to be very psychologically healing. I would say that at bottom, the way that I'm most influenced by Buddhism clinically is my belief in our capacity to transcend suffering in this life, right? So that was the Buddha's radical notion, the, you know, the third noble truth, that suffering could end today, even. <laughs> now, that's not usually borne out by people who enter into therapy because typically there are complicated experiences and pain and suffering that will take time to understand. But just that idea, right, that it's possible to truly work through whatever it is we have lived through, I find to be very, very useful clinically because most people who go into therapy are worried that at best, they're going to learn how to cope, but they're not actually going to learn how to or find an ability to really thrive. And so I think when clinicians can hold up that possibility of real integration and real transcendence, um, it can give a patient a real sense of hope, you know, especially when they're, they're not experiencing hope. So you can carry the hope for them. Um, the other way in which I'm more obviously influenced by Buddhism clinically is in, in the idea of Buddha nature. So Freud posited the mind as being an inherently conflictual place, right, that by nature of all of our id-based urges, our aggression, our sexuality that's totally unconcerned with the external world, we're going we're gonna to experience a lot of conflict, both internally and interpersonally. And in the Dharma, it's suggested that the mind is not actually inherently conflictual. You know, that as I was talking about before, its deepest nature is placid goodness. And also that it, it allows for real wisdom. So part of what I try to do is appeal to the Buddha nature, to the wisdom of my clients, again, regardless of their suffering and their, their circumstances. Larry. 
Mm-hmm. They need to go different pieces and different ways to live. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a part of what you're saying that I agree with completely, and I think it's really important to, to appreciate the radical differences of these traditions. They come out of radically different socioeconomic um, and historical conditions. The, the founders had radically different life experiences, and indeed, the goals are quite different and the methods are different. So I think it's problematic to conflate the traditions, and there, there are many people who attempt to do that. I don't. I mean, when I'm, when I'm working as a psychoanalyst, I really appreciate that that's the method I'm utilizing. And I have been influenced by, by Buddhist practice, so it, it brings something to the way in which I'm relating to my patients, but it doesn't radically alter the practice. So I'm not, I'm not meditating with my patients, for instance, um, unless, unless they ask me to, to teach the meditation. Um, so I think Part of what you're saying that's so important is that if you appreciate the differences in these traditions, then you can really reap the benefits. And I hear all the time from particularly American Buddhists that therapy and Buddhism are basically the same thing. You know, they're both systems for healing uh, where we're trying to work through our suffering. But as a result, there are lots of American Buddhists who are suffering from addictions, um, from all sorts of complicated interpersonal struggles that never get worked through in their Buddhist practice. And for that reason, um, I think it's really important to appreciate that these are not, not the same methods at all. But I do think they're compatible and different. Yeah. Your answer motivates the following question. Okay. Um, you've used the phrase the optimal frustration. Um, that just immediately brings to my mind the experience of being in school, whether as a student or as a teacher. Mm -hmm. What would an education look like in Buddhist terms? That is, uh, so much of what we do at a place like this mm -hmm. is predicated on singularity and individual accomplishment individual transfer of information, individual grades. How do you open up that third space in an educational context? Hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> As Bob knows, I, uh, in addition to being deeply interested in psychoanalysis and Buddhism, I'm also very interested in education, uh, and particularly the psychology of education. Well, What I want to say, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday in, in Bob's class that he teaches here, that our subjectivity matters, right? And so that's, that's a gift that psychoanalysis offers, that who we are individually, who took care of us, what happened to them, right? How, how we have gone through our various developmental stages, that, that really matters. So, in any thriving, helpful educational system, there has to be a way of honoring the importance of subjectivity, right? Not, not trying to obliterate it by nature of creating uh, a collective. At the same time, and this is really what interests me about the psychology of religion is, I think we can only enter into traditions, whether they're educational or religious, if our subjectivity is fully intact. And if it is, that's when we get to be deeply curious about who we can discover beyond oneself. So I would start with, with subjectivity and work out from there. No place for that on the current application form. <laughs> no, alas. Any other questions? Yeah. David. 
Yeah. Well, there's a wealth, now there's a wealth of research going on in, in terms of the meditative experience. Um, and there are all sorts of neurobiologists who are keenly interested. And this has been going on for, I want to say, 30, 30 plus years. Um, and indeed, you know, as is the case with interpersonal neurobiology, the research shows that our, our brains are radically altered. You know, our, our neurology is radically altered by meditative experience and by emotionally corrective experience. Um, and Cozzolino is, is one such researcher who writes about that in his book on attachment and interpersonal neurobiology, if you're interested. Well, I, I'm going to close it by saying how extraordinary it is that our Center for the Study of Science and Religion, that Cynthia and I manage together as best we can, should have had the gift of having Dr. Jennings as a student, and then a colleague, and then a friend, and then a teacher, all in a very short number of years. We are, as a center, counting Annie and Amy and Cynthia and myself, an example of hitting the restart button over and over again. So thanks a lot, Pilar. You're very